What's up guys, it's Ian here, back with this week's edition of the weekly training series with voiceover for the week of January 3rd, 2022. Let's get into it. I started off with three sets of 8 to 10 repetitions, weighted dips. I only added 45 pounds. It's been a few months since I performed any weighted dips, so I'm just starting off really light. This probably felt like an RPE of 6 or 7 or so, which is rate of perceived exertion, 6 or 7. 7 out of 10 with 10 being the hardest and 1 being the easiest. So 10 is an all out effort, couldn't get a single more rep or any more weight, 1 being extremely easy. To give you a sense of perspective, we're talking about the RPE scale based on fairly optimal rest and recovery conditions. Although RPE is particularly useful for calibrating your training intensities and or set and rep schemes if your recovery is a bit off. It still enables you to get in some type of workout and training stimulus without necessitating fully optimal recovery. After the weighted dips moved on to rings turned out push-ups, I just did two sets of five here because I had already done three sets of the weighted dips. Two sets of rings turned out push-ups felt about right. After that, just two sets of push-ups on parallettes, bringing the workout up to a running total of seven sets. My first set of push-ups was really quick tap and go push-ups. I got 30 reps, kind of like a warm-up set. Second set of push-ups, I paused at the bottom, paused at the top. Maybe it wasn't a very clearly defined pause on each repetition, but I was slowing down a lot at the bottom and slowing down at the top. I only got 12 reps and it felt challenging. It shows you how much more difficult an exercise like push-ups can be, even with the body weight, if you manipulate the tempo and throw in some pauses at either end of the range of motion, one or both ends of the range of motion can be fine in terms of creating more intensity without adding any additional weight. If you don't have any additional weight or equipment and you just want to make body weight push-ups more difficult, consider pausing at the bottom, pausing at the top, and you can get a significantly greater magnitude of effect on a rep for rep basis out of just a plain body weight push-up. Moving on, three sets of planche variations. I performed two sets of an advanced tuck and one set of a tuck to knee drop into advanced tuck. This felt pretty difficult today, but I powered through it just three sets working towards the goals. Who knows, maybe by the end of 2022, I'll have a straddle or I'll be able to hold the advanced tuck for a while. I'm going to continue to train these diligently and hopefully it leads to a good result. Moving on, I performed three sets of body weight chin ups. These felt pretty good today. By this point in the workout, I was getting a bit tired, but I just had to do a few sets of back just to round out my weekly training volume, get that third day per week worth of frequency to stay on track and get closer to my goals. After that, three sets of front lever variation. My hips were feeling pretty tight today. I did work on my mobility work a little bit, but I still need to do it more often. So instead of performing any of the more difficult variations of front lever, I just performed three sets of advanced tuck. I attempted one set of a straddle, but it didn't feel too good, so I didn't even hold it. I just came out of it. I just held the advanced tuck for time. I'm going to keep stretching and hopefully I feel better by Wednesday and we'll try a more moderate variation of the front lever. If I don't feel better by then, I'll just hold the advanced tuck for long holds again, try to accumulate a lot of volume. Even though it might feel bad mentally to perform an easier variation than what you're capable of under optimal recovery conditions, just remember that the technique practice and the volume accrued is still beneficial in the long run and it will still contribute to your overall goals and progress. So don't feel too bad about it, just remember that it is leading you in the right direction and bringing you closer to your goals. After the front lever variations, I performed the standing band curl, just standing on the band with one foot, the same side of foot as the hand that is curling. What I'm focusing on here is squeezing both glutes really hard, to keep the hip locked out, squeezing the abs, and then keeping the elbow where it is. And then I'm curling up. Because of the nature of resistance curves associated with bands, there's not much tension at the bottom of this exercise. So below and above that 90 degree mark is where you really need to manipulate the tempo of this exercise to get the most out of the band. Right below the 90 degree at the elbow mark, and then right above the 90 degree at the elbow mark, right around 90 degrees, that's where you really wanna slow down the movement 
movement, consider pausing at that peak tension point for a second, and that's gonna really get you the most out of this exercise. That's what I recommend for these banded curls. To progress load, either work your way up to a thicker band over time, hold multiple smaller bands, one medium band and a light band, so you can gradually add more light bands, consider holding multiple bands, or what I do here in the video is I'm actually working my hand lower and lower down the band. Working your hand down the band that you are currently working on will get you more tension out of that given band, although you don't want to overly shorten a thin band because it does increase the risk of breaking the band, so don't break your bands. Once you feel like you have too much tension on the band, or if you feel like you're excessively stretching a band, I recommend just switching to a thicker band or looping together multiple thinner bands. So don't overly stretch your bands, but you can lower your hand on the band and use a shorter segment with the same range of motion, and that will require you to produce more force to bring your hand through the same range of motion while holding a slightly shortened band. To round it out, I performed three sets of face pulls. Normally I'll perform sets of 10 to 20 with the banded face pull, but today I just performed sets of 12 and I paused with my elbows and hands close to the face. So I paused in that finished position. If you haven't watched the other weeks in this series, I do talk about the face pull every week. There are some exercises that appear every week. The main thing that I'm focusing on is pulling through the hands, pulling them apart slightly, and aiming for the elbows and hands to reach the end of the range of motion at the same time. So if you watch the video here, I'm not just pulling through the hands or the elbows, but I'm pulling through the hands and the elbows, and I want them to both reach the finish position around the same time. I know if you slow down the video a lot, it's not going to be the exact same time, but I do want the elbows and hands to reach the end of the range of motion at pretty much the same time or very close proximity to each other, and that's going to be the proper technique for face pulls. It is technically a compound movement, although you're mostly performing these for the rear delts. There is probably a little bit of side delt activation and some of the other upper back muscles as well. That's all for today, January 3rd. I will see you on January 5th with my next upper body day, mostly a back day. And until then, don't let anybody stop your gains. What's up? Today is Wednesday, January 5th. We're going over the back day portion of this week's weekly training roundup with voiceover series. I started off with four sets of five repetitions on the weighted chin up. Today was the first week or first workout this training cycle where I actually performed any weighted chin-ups. So I didn't perform the top set because it would have been a pretty severe violation of the acute to chronic workload theory. If you'd like me to explain that more, I can make a video breaking it down more in depth as a standalone video because I think it is such an important topic and I don't want it to be buried in here. But essentially, chronic workload refers to what training stress you're accustomed to on average over a given period of time, hence chronic long-term training stress. Acute refers to the training stress that you may experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So essentially, if you haven't performed weighted chin-ups or a high intensity, high threshold type of exercise, and then you are all of a sudden exposed to a high stress exercise like a weighted chin-up, it might be good to ease into it with a bit of lighter days and then gradually work towards hitting those top singles. So if you're not acclimated to it, consider a more gradual acclimation process. Try not to violate your acute to chronic workload too severely. Obviously, you have to violate it bit by bit to acclimate yourself to more intensity over time, but if you can avoid violating that acute to chronic workload in too severe of a manner, that's going to lower your injury risk and lead to better training outcomes long term. After my four sets of five on weighted chin ups, I moved to front lever variations on rings. I think last week I forgot to do my front lever variations on rings. I just did them all on the bar. One day worth of my front lever practice is done on rings just to stress the joints in a slightly different manner. I have a theory that if you distribute your front lever training between the rings and the bar, it may slightly decrease your risk of overuse injury. The same is definitely not true for the planche. Planche on rings is much more difficult than planche on parallettes or the floor even. In terms of easiest to hardest, it goes parallettes, floor, rings. Rings are definitely the hardest by far. With the front lever variations, there's not really a big difference in difficulty. Feel free to perform whatever front lever variation that you can perform on a bar on rings. After my front lever practice, I performed three sets of horizontal body rows on rings. These were pretty mild 
wild, moving fast, just a higher rep exercise to get some extra training volume with the more high threshold, high intensity exercises today being the weighted chin-ups and the knee bent half lay front levers. These horizontal body rows were just a bit of extra back volume at a milder intensity performed for high repetitions to get that extra training volume in. After these horizontal body rows, I performed three sets of 12 to 15 repetitions on ring push-ups. These are normal ring push-ups. I performed the rings turned out push-ups on Monday this week. So Wednesday this week, I'm performing an easier variation of the ring push-ups. If I feel good Friday, I might try rings turned out push-ups again on Friday. We'll see how things are on Friday. I told you in previous iterations of the weekly training roundup series that I feel for my current fitness level that the ring turned out push-ups is a bit too stressful to perform three times a week. So at least one of the workouts, I'll just be performing normal ring push-ups or even push-ups on parallels. Although I think push-ups on parallels are easy enough that I've added those on Monday, even after performing the rings turned out push-ups. Not really in the same category, but for my current fitness level, I think the rings turned out push-up might be a little bit too stressful to perform three days a week. In week one, I did try to perform that exercise three days a week. It felt good for week one, but week two, I was overwhelmed with fatigue. So I'm just trying to monitor my overall fatigue levels, not let them get too out of hand and try to manage it by trying to avoid burnout. Some days will be harder. Some days will be more conservative today. The normal ring push-ups, more conservative. Still, I like these getting in good quality chest contraction, trying to press the palms together, touching those rings together at the top of each repetition. That really helps me feel the biggest contraction in the chest as I'm performing these normal ring push-ups. After the ring push-ups, I performed three sets of advanced tuck planche and it felt pretty good. I think for the planche variation, I'm getting more used to leaning further and further forward. Thinking about my head position as I'm performing these, I think in prior weeks, I either had my head too lifted or too low. I think the proper head position for the planche is really neutral with the spine. I need to work on that more. It's a bit hard to think about consciously, but it's definitely something that I've noticed watching the videos in post-production. This Friday, I'm going to attempt band assisted straddle planches and see how that goes. These advanced tucks are feeling better and better, but it does still feel quite difficult. After the advanced tuck planches, I just did two sets of dumbbell curl to band face pull supersets. At this point, I had finished making dinner and my food was getting a bit cold. I was kind of cooking my food and tending to my dinner during my rest periods. You know, when you work out, sometimes you gotta rest. Maybe you're resting one to three minutes between each set. You gotta have something to do. So instead of just sitting around, I was cooking my dinner. I think I finished cooking right around when I finished up my advanced tuck planche. And by that point, my food was just getting cold. So I only performed two sets of the dumbbell curl to band face pull supersets. With the dumbbell curl, I mentioned how I'm limited by weight and I've basically been rotating between band curls and dumbbell curls. I think I've been performing band curls on Mondays and Saturdays and dumbbell curls on Wednesdays. That might change as the stimulus to fatigue ratio of each of these exercises changes. If the band curls get overused, I might just straight up rotate it each time a curl variation appears in my training plan. So go ABA style, band curl, dumbbell curl, band curl, dumbbell curl, etc. I might just rotate through them in that manner. To get the most out of dumbbell curls where you don't have access to a lot of weight, it's important to perform them with strict technique. So it's important to use a really firm grip, even pause for a second at the top where you're under that peak contraction. And then at the bottom of the range of motion, you can not relax, but let the weight come to a complete stop before you begin the next repetition. It's a well-known fact in sports science and physiology that when a muscle is rapidly lengthened and then contracted, you get what's called the pre-stretch reflex, which allows you to exert higher forces subsequent to the quick lengthening and contraction. But by pausing with the dumbbell in the bottom position of the dumbbell curl, you negate the pre-stretch reflex and lower your efficiency here. This might sound harmful because it negates your ability to produce the most force, but it also does allow you to get more effect out of less weight. Obviously, if you're at a gym and you have access to whatever dumbbells you would need or want for heavier dumbbell curls, you want to use the pre-stretch reflex to your advantage. But if you're weight limited and you don't have very heavy weights at home, consider trying out a pause at the bottom and and the top of the dumbbell curl and that'll let you disrupt the bicep a little bit more during these curls even with limited weight. Hopefully some of these tips and voiceover helped you if you're performing any of these exercises in your workouts. If you want to see me break down any of these exercises more in depth or any other exercise
exercise or training concept more in depth in its own video, drop a comment down below and let me know what you'd like to see a standalone video on, whether it's an exercise, a concept, just a general fitness question, drop a comment down below. This was Wednesday, January 5th for the back day installment of this week's weekly training roundup with the voiceover series. I will see you on Friday, the chest day. Don't let anybody stop your gains. What's up guys? It's Ian here bringing you the voiceover from Friday, January 7th. Today is my chest day. Today I started off with a few sets of body weight dips. Then I moved on to band resisted dips. Here I'm basically just loading the top portion of the dip. When the bands are slung over the back of the neck and held onto the bars like this, they're really only engaged in the top half of the dip. The bottom of the dip is essentially a body weight dip and then the top half of the dip is a band resisted dip. Performed these today in the 8 to 12 rep range. I used a black band and a yellow band. This was a pretty high amount of tension, so they felt pretty challenging in that rep range right there. You can really pause at the top of these, focus on getting the elbows pretty much extended or locked out as long as you don't have any hypermobility issues, get the shoulders fully depressed, work on that support position. These band resisted dips can definitely help refine your bar support without placing too much stress on the shoulders or other joints at the bottom of the range of motion. This is a great exercise to try out if weighted dips give you issues, if body weight dips are fine for you, and you're just looking for an alternative to the weighted dip, try out these band resisted dips instead of the weighted dips. Next up, I performed three sets of handstand push ups. These felt pretty tough today. I might have to play around with exercise ordering and put these at a different part of the workout because the band resisted dip is so hard on the triceps, and the handstand push up is also pretty hard on the triceps. I have a feeling that I could get more out of the handstand push up if I put it either on a different day or a different portion of this workout. I performed three sets of six to 10 on the handstand push up here. But again, I feel like my triceps were a limiting factor due to the acute fatigue of having just performed the band resisted dips. Moving on from there, I performed three sets of five on the rings turned out push ups. Here, I'm progressing these by just getting deeper in the push up, bringing the hands to the body, trying to lean forward at the bottom of it as much as possible. Although sometimes as the fatigue sets in, it is hard to do so. Just three sets of five here on the rings turned out push up. I also performed the rings turned out push up on Monday this week, but not on Wednesday. I'm back to just performing the rings turned out push up twice a week. It felt pretty reasonable to perform it twice this week. I think going forward, I'll perform this exercise either once or twice a week, but probably not three times. In last week's weekly training roundup video, I talked about how on a rep for rep basis, the rings turned out push ups are much more stressful than either normal push ups or normal ring push ups. I don't think that it's necessarily a sustainable exercise for me to perform three days a week at my current fitness level. I could envision that if you were an individual who was very fit, capable of producing a lot of force, and this was an easy exercise for you, it might not be a big issue to perform it three times a week. So when deciding the frequency for an exercise in your own training program, just think about how difficult it is for you specifically, and try not to base your program too much on other people's programs, because an exercise that might be easy for you might be really hard for somebody else and the opposite can also be true. An exercise that might be really hard for you might be easy for somebody else. So don't be surprised when you see significant differences between the programs of different people. After the rings turned out push-ups, I performed three sets of band assisted straddle planche. This was really hard. I'm kind of feeling like if I do perform the band assisted straddle variations or more advanced variations, I might have to add more band assistance just to make it easier. I feel like with the planche training, the biggest problem with planching is that there's a huge difficulty gap between the advanced tuck and the straddle. I get the feeling that you'd probably have to be able to hold an advanced tuck maybe like 15 to 30 seconds naturally before you can get a straddle at all. Right now, I can only hold an advanced tuck for about 5 to 10 seconds depending on the day. And I feel like it's very hard to accumulate meaningful enough volume of practice in the advanced tuck because it is pretty stressful. And the tuck with the knees into the chest is just just not similar enough to the straddle planche that I feel like it will really lead to a straddle planche. So for instance, I kind of doubt that just performing tuck planche for sets of 15 to 20 seconds several times a week would be the most direct way to unlocking the straddle planche. I think some combination of tuck, advanced tuck, and a more heavily banded straddle might be the way to go. So I might start organizing it in that manner. So one of the days I'll perform the tuck planche for really long holds, then I'll have an intermediate 
intermediate day, where I perform the advanced tuck naturally unassisted for as long as I can, intermediate holds, and then on the third day, I'll perform the band assisted straddle with enough band assistance that I'm able to hold the straddle for about five seconds or so. Here you can see in the video that with this level of band assistance, I'm really only able to hold the position for one to three seconds, and I just don't think that that is meaningful enough in terms of volume accumulation to really unlock the straddle planche. So that's going to be my new strategy for unlocking the unassisted straddle planche. Hopefully one day I'm going to perform an easier day for high volume, an intermediate day for intermediate volume and force production, and then the hardest day with a little bit less intensity and a little bit more volume than I currently am. After the band assisted straddle planche, I felt pretty brutalized. So I just finished off the workout with a tri set of band tricep pushdown to band face pull to iron grip grip trainer. And I performed three sets of this tricep pushdown, really just focusing on keeping the torso tight, keeping the shoulders depressed, trying to keep the elbows where they are. If you want bonus points or you just don't have a very thick band, you can consider pausing at the bottom of these where the band is the most stretched and that can definitely make it more difficult. With the face pulls, same as normal, pulling through the elbows and hands at the same time, really trying to finish this exercise with the elbows and hands reaching the end position at the same time and pull those hands apart slightly for extra benefit. If you have a full loop band, it's not worth cutting open your full loop band just to do this. But if you do have one of those bands with two individual ends, that might be a useful variation in your band face pulls. So that way you're not always using the full loop band. I do feel like I'm getting kind of tired of the full loop band, but I don't have unlimited band access, so I'm not going to cut open the band. But if you do break any of your full loop bands, consider tying the ends into knots to use as handles and try out some face pulls like that. It is a unique type of exercise compared to doing face pulls with the full loop band. I think doing face pulls with a band that has two distinct ends can feel a little bit different and some people may prefer it over doing face pulls with a full loop band. And then after that, I just performed the grip trainers. If you're more curious about these and the build quality of them, I do have a full review on them. They are quite difficult for me. I was using the trainer level in this video. I can't yet do working sets with the number one model. If I'm really warmed up and not tired, I can probably close the number one model about once, maybe once or twice. But for me, for the working sets, I find the trainer model is about the right difficulty. In this video, I'm not closing it on all the reps. I might have gotten it closed on the first rep and then just done partial reps, but I feel like it is still useful. And the trainer model is the lightest intensity of the Iron Mind grip trainers that I own. So it's what I'll stick with for the time being, unless I end up ordering a lighter model, which I probably won't. I'll probably just work at this trainer model until I'm able to perform it for more repetitions. All right, so that was the Friday installment of this week's weekly training roundup. What's up, guys? This is the voiceover for Saturday, January 8th, for this week's installment of the weekly training roundup with voiceover series for the week of January 3rd. Today was my back day. My friend convinced me to go to the gym, so I didn't get the home workout footage. I started off with three sets of pull-ups. I did two sets of 10, and then the third set is shown here. I believe I got 11 or 12 reps. After that, I performed cable lat pushdowns. I performed four sets of these. All the exercises that you see here are intentionally exercises that I would be able to perform an analogous version of at home. I am able to perform band or cable let pushdowns at home. I do have a cable pulley system. I think they're a good exercise to get additional volume and really isolate those lats. Cable let pushdowns and band let pushdowns tend to have a pretty good stimulus to fatigue ratio. After the let pushdowns, I performed a few sets of cable curls. I was going to do dumbbell curls because it's more analogous to something that I could perform at home, but I like cable curls. They're actually one of my favorite exercises exercises. I'll show you an alternate exercise that you might be interested in if you have a loading pin and some plates and a bar. I know we're getting into a lot of different items there, but if you have just some plates and a rope and maybe some type of handle, you can perform a very similar type of curl to replace cable curls for an at-home exercise. I'll probably make that a standalone video because I don't have footage of it at the time that I'm organizing this weekly training roundup video, but there is a way to perform curls similar to cable curls where you have the weight of fixed below the handle using either a loading pin or some type of rope tied to the plate itself, but that will be its own video. Look out for it in the future. I moved on to some front lever practice. I actually only performed one set of straddle front lever. I had had two other days of front lever practice this week, so it wasn't too much of a setback that I only performed one set here. It did feel pretty good though. It 
Moving on after that, I just rounded off the workout with some body weight dips. I did a few sets of these here. Nothing too special to see here. I think I did about 30 reps. Just gives me some content to show as I do the voiceover. This was a pretty quick workout. Went to a gym in person. Moving forward, most of my training will be at home though. Most of these training roundups, you see me filming them in my kitchen. Hopefully you found this week's installment of the weekly training roundup useful. Maybe some useful tips that you can take with you into your own workouts and use to further your own fitness goals. Some of the things that I think about as I'm exercising and after. More videos coming soon. At home leg workout video coming soon. I'll make you that curling video coming soon. Both standalone videos just so they're easier to look up and find. As always, let me know in the comment section down below what standalone videos you'd like to see come next and I'll put them in the queue. I'll get to them as soon as I finish the leg workout video and the at home curling video. Just drop your comments down below. Video requests, any fitness questions that you might have. If it seems like a good enough question, I'll make it a standalone video. Otherwise, I'll just stick it in a multi-question question and answer video. Either way, I will get to it in comment form or video form. Thank you for watching this video and don't let anybody stop your gains.